This is a Chronicle podcast, bringing you ideas in the service of medicine. From the Chronicle podcast system, this is the NPC podcast of the National Pharmaceutical Congress for October 11th, 2023. The NPC podcast is where we discuss and consider the pharma industry's purpose, process and people, and today, we'll continue the healthcare conversation. This program is presented in cooperation with Impress, Canada's next generation commercial partner. The industry is rapidly evolving, and Impress is designed to help you evolve with it. Learn more about Impress tailored best-in-class solutions at www.impress.com. Our guest today is Bonnie Crombie, Mayor of the City of Mississauga, Ontario. After this podcast was recorded, Mayor Crombie took a leave of absence from her position, in order to contest the leadership of the Liberal Party of Ontario. Here she is with your hosts, Jim, Mark, and Mitch. And to start a new season of conversations, here's Mitch Shannon, CEO of Chronicle Companies. Welcome back to the NPC podcast from the National Pharmaceutical Congress. I'm your co-host, Mitch Shannon, and we're back with you again from the gondola here high atop Pill Hill, where the views are clear and the sight lines are unimpeded. And whenever I hear the term unimpeded, my mind turns immediately to thoughts of Jim Shea, the general manager at the Council for Continuing Pharmaceutical Education in Montreal. Jim, a question for you. Does a person need to be impeded before he can become unimpeded? Oh, geez, I wish you hadn't asked me that. You know, I got to bring up my physics stuff here. You know, I had the same question, you know, used to keep me up at night until I really took the very popular CCP course, Why You Talk in Physics in a Doctor's Office? You know, and the case study presented in there from Newton's Three Laws of Motion. Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory explains Newton's Law to Penny. And basically, you see, you know, the one about inertia, and he basically says that for, for the motion of an object to change, a force must act upon it. And, and since motion implies movement, Penny obviously observes that in Nebraska, you have to be unimpeded before you can be impeded with an arrest. I could go on and on with this verbal inertia, really, and apply Newton's second law, the force equals, you know, to impede myself on this verbal inertia. So we'll go to the third law where, you know, we're going to be able to have some action reaction in this Q&A on topics of increased gravity. So lesson learned, never ask me about anything related to physics. You you lost me at the Big Bang Theory, but uh, we'll, we'll pick it up again. Pharmaceutical industry consultant and health policy expert, Mr. Mark McElwain, has never been accused of being impeded on a single day in his long and admirable life. Mark, please share your secrets. What are your tips for staying the course? Unimpeded. You know, I'm thinking about the gondola and the old gardens, and I guess it's about doing our best to look beyond that obstacle. You just can't help but be more optimistic when you remember that there are still 40 games left in the J season or that the Leafs really will win another Stanley Cup someday. Not not according to a Habs fan, sorry. All right. Well, we are your podcast hosts, known to you as Jim, Mark, and Mitch, because all the snappy brand names are already in use, such as Paramount Fine Food Sportsplex and Port Credit Lighthouse. And uh, this is our special City Hall Desk edition of the podcast today. So let's welcome the right worshipful, the mayor of the ancient and honorable city of Mississauga, Ontario, Mayor Bonnie Crombie. Nice to have you here. Thanks so much. We're not so ancient. We're celebrating 50 years next year. It'll be our 50th birthday. Well, me too. So that'll be fun. So you are the mayor of Mississauga and the city's CEO. Please tell our listeners a bit about your administration and the current vision. Well, uh, we have a very bright, dynamic city driven by innovation and diversity. And my vision revolves around building a smart and connected community that fosters economic growth, enhances quality of life for our residents and positions us as a leader in the global marketplace. And I have to say that just talking about Pill Hill, which we are affectionately known as, we're very, very proud to be the country's leading hub for life sciences and the second largest in the country as an employer 
of individuals in the life sciences sector. And that's thanks to the leading biopharma companies who are pushing the envelope when it comes to research and innovation. We have over 500 companies who have chosen to invest here as bi life sciences companies that is, and they're building our ecosystem. Frankly, we're the only city that I'm aware of that has a strategy to attract more investment from life sciences. We have over 26,000 people here employed in the sector. And I think that's the second largest hub in Canada. Not bad since we're the sixth or seventh, depends on the day, largest city in the country. So we continue to attract investment and we create an environment that's really conducive to the success of businesses, including and in particular the pharmaceutical companies. Mayor Crombie, it's Mark. And, you know, we often start the podcast by asking how the guest's educational background contributed to the career journey. So in your case, was there a particularly important building block towards getting to the mayor's chair? Well, there are, I guess there are no specific educational requirements to being mayor, but in my case, I have an undergraduate degree in political science and economics, which I guess helps shape my dedication to public service, but I also have an MBA and a director's degree, so I do sit on other boards, including the local utility electricity distributor and the police board. But I think the background in poli-sci and a passion for politics since a young age, frankly, I was knocking on doors from the time I was 16 for other people, never myself. I never anticipated a life in public service for myself other than on the other side of the table. But it provided me with a strong foundation in policy analysis, decision making, enabled me to understand the complexities of government and to be able to effectively serve my community. And certainly before I entered public service, I enjoyed a 20 year long career in business, working for some Fortune 500 companies, not a pharmaceutical company, but certainly a restaurant giant, McDonald's Corporation, entertainment giant, well, Disney company. I've worked in the ad agency. I've worked for uh, an advocacy group, Insurance Bureau of Canada. I've started my own company and I've done consulting too, you know, when I needed to step back a little bit before I entered politics. So there's been a lot going on in Mississauga in recent years, and I'm wondering what projects or initiatives you're most proud of. There are so many. Let me see if I can encapsulate them for you. But I'm extremely proud of the various projects and initiatives that have transformed Mississauga into the thriving and innovative city that we are. A notable project that will be of interest to you is the establishment of our cutting edge innovation corridor, which will serve as a hub for technology, research and development. We also have significant investments in improving our transportation infrastructure, such as our light rail transit that should be completed by late next year or early 2025. We've expanded other public transit options. We've enhanced connectivity within our city and within neighboring regions. Our focus has been on education and workforce development. We work closely with the colleges and universities here in our city to ensure they're training our students for the jobs of tomorrow and the jobs that are available in our marketplace today. So of course, we have an academy of medicine and we have very specific training undergraduate programs at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus that relate directly directly to the life sciences sector, specialized training programs with other local institutions as well. That's a pretty impressive list of things that you've been taking on in Mississauga. And it actually leads into the next couple of questions that I was going to ask, but I think I'm just going to ask you one because you've already gone through that list is, you know, Mississauga is becoming what it's become or, and it's going to become even bigger in the future. How are you actually promoting this image to attract pharmaceutical companies to invest in your area? So, you know, there's so much going on in Mississauga, as we've already talked about. There are a number of advantages to pharmaceutical companies with respect to their locations and operations here. I've already shared with you that we have a thriving life sciences sector today, the second largest in Canada. As I mentioned, the 500 companies and 26,000 employees in the sector. And we offer several advantages to pharma companies for considering locating their operations here. Of course, there's the highly trained, highly skilled diverse because we speak many languages here as well, talent work pool, talent pool. And that's also thanks to those world-class educational institutions and a very multicultural community that speaks uh, uh, 200 languages from over 150 different countries. We offer, as I mentioned earlier, an undergraduate degree specific to a master's in biotech programming, which is a specialty that can, students can only receive this degree right here at UTM. So that's very interesting. And also at the Institute of Management and Innovation at UTM, 
They're home to the M Biotech program, which I just mentioned, and they're already celebrating their 20th anniversary. And we have students from far and wide coming here to access that program. It's the first of its kind to incorporate both science and business along with the eight month work experience. It's highly regarded among industry and many in our Mississauga companies like GSK, AstraZeneca, Amgen. They hire specifically these students and a majority of graduating students end up staying here, of course, in Mississauga. After their graduation, we like to encourage people think of us as a place to get their education, to live, to work, to invest, to stay, you know, <laughs> raise their children. So we like the multi-generational approach. And additionally, you know, we're very strategically positioned with very easy easy access to our city. We have seven major highways here. We're less than a 90 minute drive to the U.S. border, one hour flight to Boston, New York, Washington as well. And so we have easy access to the global life sciences hubs throughout our airport, which is the largest in Canada. Mississauga is home to Pearson Airport. <laughs> so people think that's in the city of Toronto, but it's actually in Mississauga. And also we're home to world-class healthcare institutions like Trillium Health Partners, hospitals. We have three of them, Credit Valley, the Trillium Hospital, and the Queensway Hospital as well. But it's the strategic location near major transportation routes and proximity to Toronto, Boston, and Princeton, New Jersey, which of course is a big pharma hub as well, which provides unparalleled opportunities for collaboration, for access to markets, and of course, talent acquisition as well. And then I would say finally is our business-friendly environment, our strong infrastructure, and our very supportive municipal policies. We have a certainty in government too. I mean, we've only had four mayors in the past 50 years. I believe only the fourth mayor. I've served now nine years. My predecessor, she served 36 years and she left when she was 92. So those are some big advantages for locating in Mississauga. Yeah, you certainly have all the inputs and the forces in place to keep that inertia going. So uh, excellent. You're listening to Mayor Bonnie Crombie of the city of Mississauga here on the NPC podcast. So there's a noted multiplier effect to the life sciences company setting up shop in town. Every pharma job seems to inspire several additional opportunities. What specific steps are you taking to encourage entrepreneurship in Mississauga? Well, that's a great question. And I'm always out there pounding the pavement, promoting Mississauga as the ideal investment destination and in including leading events and conferences like, of course, Bio International Convention, which I attend every year as I can. I think during COVID, we may have missed one or two because we had stay in place orders. But at Bio, we always host an investor lunch where I have an opportunity to share more about what our city has to offer, our value proposition, if I and we've talked about why companies like Roche Canada Pharma continue to invest here, to grow in the region, what's new, what's exciting, what are new and exciting opportunities at CORE Mississauga, which is the first state-of-the-art purpose-built life sciences campus designed for innovators. I also lead foreign direct investment missions to promote Mississauga as a thriving hub for life sciences. And I'm very proud <laughs> that I secured a massive $56 million foreign direct investment by Biolab, which were based in Brazil, South American company. And that created 40 very high paying jobs, high value added jobs, many in R&D. And I will share with you between us, stole them away from New Jersey where they were headed until they met me. And I convinced them that they needed to be in Canada and most specifically in Mississauga and our life sciences hub here. And I also work with our, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry about that. You don't want to get those New Jersey guys upset. <laughs> no, well, sorry. You know, we have a different approach here than they take in the U.S., but it's very persuasive as well. And I hope that I'm very persuasive as well. But listen, I work with our local educational institutions to develop programs to meet the industry's workforce needs and cultivate a talent pipeline for our pharmaceutical companies. So, and smaller, leading edge, Canadian grown companies are also growing out of our universities, creating a pipeline of talent and innovation in some of the sectors most promising startups began as scientific breakthroughs within the University of Toronto's Mississauga Center of Medicinal Chemistry, which has been really instrumental in fostering innovation and incubating talent. And with the recent launch of Spin Up at UTM, UTM's position has been, I think, solidified as a research, innovation, and translation hub within not only our region, but also within Ontario and Canada as a whole. And it is our first ever life sciences wet lab. 
this incubator is going to be critical in bridging the gap between academic breakthroughs and real world applications, fostering a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship in Mississauga. So leading biopharma companies like Roche, AstraZeneca, Nova Nordis, and Bora Pharmaceuticals have also recognized the potential of our city, of our people in our future, leading them to invest and grow. So continued investment in our city. We recognize the growth potential. Mississauga is also one of the few cities with a dedicated sector strategy to support its extension and expansion efforts. And that's really in thanks to the diligent work done by my economic development office. And their success is closely tied to maintaining strong connections with the industry and by understanding the factors influencing growth and success that have been able to take timely and effective actions. And let me just give you an example of that because I know I'm, I'm talking for a long time, but one really notable example is our responsiveness in addressing and advocating for the industry's interests with regard to the Patent Medicines Prices Review Board, PMPRB, right? And since 2017, we've advocated and I have been a strong advocate over concerns about the proposed PMPRB regulation changes. We've hosted roundtable with Mississauga businesses, with industry, with Mississauga members of parliament to listen to the concerns of the industry over the PMPRB regulatory changes. And we've also spoken directly with ministers about our concerns. And so when the industry expressed their concerns over the federal government's changes to PMPRB, that would see drug prices lowered and have the unintended consequences of stifling innovation and, you know, reducing the level of R&D and driving it out of Canada. I wrote a letter to the minister and got on the phone and made as many phone calls as I could and expressed my concern and asking them to engage with the sector directly so they too could learn more about not only the concerns, but the unintended consequences of what they were attempting to do. But also along with the industry, we proposed solutions. So it was during one of these roundtables with industry that they told me that the changes would drive the investment out of the country and specifically out of my city in Mississauga. And it would reduce access to new medications for patients, especially those with rare diseases, because clinical trials would be halted as with the launch of new drugs. So I think that we can all agree that increasing access and lowering costs to life-saving drugs is important to Canadians. It's important from the perspective of the industry too, to ensure that they can remain competitive and grow right here in Canada. So since then, I understand understand that the sector's advocacy has resulted in some positive outcomes and including the delayed implementation, and I hope permanently delayed, uh, greater consultation and the decision not to proceed with some of the uh, proposed changes. And our economic development office continues to engage in feedback through to the PMPRB through open consultation. So that was a big, big win for us. And I'll say that I think we were the lead connector in all that advocacy. Indeed. I mean, as a guy sitting in the second hub over here in Montreal, I can't be but uh, impressed by all the activity and the things that you guys are doing over in Mississauga. And again, I'm going to boil down a couple of questions into one now because you've hit so many points that I was going to talk about. But, uh, you know, it comes down to now it's really important to balance the need for economic development with environmental sustainability. So in Mississauga, generally, how are you handling that kind of stuff? Absolutely. So it goes without saying that the city understands the importance of sustainability and we are completed or started 70% of all the actions in our climate change action plan. We declared a climate emergency back in, I think it was June of 2019, and we're looking to fast track our target so that we can achieve net zero by 2050. We're doing this by electrifying our corporate fleet, installing electric vehicle charging infrastructure, building lower carbon buildings such as uh, a net zero fire station that we're very proud of and designing a home energy retrofit program for our residents. And through our Sustainable Mississauga initiative, we promote sustainable practices, energy efficiency and waste reduction. We collaborate with industry partners to encourage the adoption of green technologies and sustainable manufacturing processes. And earlier this year, we launched the Mississauga Climate Leaders Program, which aims at aims to support support local private and public sector leaders committed to measuring and reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. And we're actively engaged with companies to develop and enforce environmental regulations and standards to ensure that they too can comply with best practices. So Bonnie, we normally stay out of party politics on this podcast, which frankly is kind of tough for me. But we can't ignore the elephant in the room, as you have recently entered the race for Ontario Liberal leadership. Congratulations. 
Thank you. And I wonder if you could comment in your view about what needs changing most in Ontario's approach to funding and access to drug benefits or perhaps with respect to the wider healthcare system. Well, you know, I won't address head on anything to do <laughs> other than my role here as mayor of this great state of Mississauga. I am engaged in this race, but, you know, there's no guarantees at the outcome. And so I'm working towards, as a candidate, a hopeful and a very successful conclusion with the race, but that's quite a few months away. But I just want to say that the industry will have an advocate and someone who is well-versed on all their issues and their needs and their concerns. And I look forward to bringing that positioning along with me, I be successful. It's Jim here again. And as we start to apply a decelerating force to our podcast, we invite you to play our action reaction word association game. So, you know, just go ahead and say the first thing that comes to mind in response to each of the following phrases or, or words. Okay. The 905. Growth opportunity. Community. Strength in diversity and unity. Oh, there you go. Diversity. <laughs> well, that's one of our greatest assets and source of innovation. Right, right. Collaboration. And collaboration is the key to driving progress and achieving goals. Investment. The catalyst for growth and economic prosperity. Development. Building a sustainable future for all. Excellent. We've been in the background compiling the scores on that. And again, this is a Googleplex, uh, you know, biggest numbers we know of points that we're going to award to you for those reactions. <laughs> so finally, we're going to go into relativity and space time now where Newton's laws are basically out the window. They break down. So it's time to put on your distinguished mayoral soothsayers hat and enter our prognostication corner where corner is spelt with a K because K is actually the time constant uh, which solves for everything. So what bold predictions can you make about the sciences industry during the upcoming 12 to 24 months? Okay, well, predicting the future is always a challenge, but I think the life sciences industry is going to continue to experience remarkable advancements in the next 12 to 24 months. We're going to continue to work with all levels of government through the launch of strategies, including the Ontario Life Sciences Strategy, and of course, our own Mississauga-made Life Sciences Strategy to help grow the market, grow the sector here, and reemphasize our own strategies. With support of all levels of government and skilled workers, we're going to continue to see that kind of growth in our city. You know, we have a very strong infrastructure, a skilled workforce, a collaborative ecosystem, and we're well positioned to embrace the trends and contribute to the ongoing advancements in the life sciences industry. In fact, earlier this year, the CEO of AstraZeneca visited Mississauga to announce a massive expansion of their R&D operations and the creation of a new center of excellence that will advance global research on rare disease, bringing 500 new skilled jobs to Mississauga. So leading biopharma companies like AstraZeneca are pushing the envelope when it comes to research and innovation, and they are investing in the potential of our city, our people, and our future. So I predict we're going to solidify our city as a place where research and development in life sciences is conducted, where innovation medicines are manufactured, and ultimately improve people's lives. And maybe I may be so bold as to say we might encroach a little bit on that number one position from number two in Canada. Well, that sounds like you have a plan, that's for sure. Very cool. Well, Bonnie, we know you've got a city of 800,000 people to run in the meantime, and it's possible one or two of them might have a request for a moment of your time during the day. So we appreciate your joining us this afternoon and wish you a continued success in that rough and tumble game of politics. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. All the best to you. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. And to all of you out there in podcast land, thank you for listening. We'll speak with you again next week. If you've got questions about today's episode, please send an email to health at chronicle.org. We always want to know what you think about our discussions. Send us your comment as a voice clip attachment, and look out world. You might just become part of a future episode. We hope you enjoyed today's NPC podcast. If you did, please like it, rate it, recommend it, and make a point of sharing it with your network. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, or 
To keep things simple, just ask your smart device to play the National Pharmaceutical Congress podcast on Audible, Spotify, Amazon Music or TuneIn Radio. The NPC podcast is presented in cooperation with Impress, Canada's next generation commercial partner. Check them out at www.impress.com. I'm your announcer, Leona Void, speaking. This podcast was produced by Jeremy Visser, with help from Amy Elder. Research for this program came from John Evans. The musical theme is performed with alacrity by the NPC Podcast Orchestra, under the direction of maestro Lucas Milbrook. We'll be back to speak with you again next week.